Saudi Arabia is taking over the world and people are losing their minds. So I've got Joe here today and we're going to break it down. But before we do, please leave a like on the video and subscribe to help us get to a thousand. So the first question we really need to answer is, is Saudi Arabia destroying the beautiful game? It's a big word and lots of connotations that come with that. Um, when you look at football throughout history, there's been lots of power shifts in terms of the leagues that have dominated uh, and had the most of the world's talent. Um, and in truth, it's always been the leagues that are willing to spend the most money recruiting the best players. Now, if you were to sustain um, a domination, um, then you're going to have to spend money consistently on recruiting the best players. You know, throughout the 1990s, uh, Syria was the sort of dominant league in terms of um, a lot of the, the biggest transfer fees were heading that way. More recent times, it has been the Premier League. Um, so with Saudi Arabia, at the moment, it's too early to say whether or not they're going to destroy football. Um, but it's certainly looking like they are trying to make a permanent mark uh, on the game. Is it going to be viewed differently from the Serie A thing in the Premier League because Saudi Arabia don't have Champions League football? That, that you know, incredible competition that everybody seems to look to to think is the ultimate elite of football. Is it, is it viewed differently because of that? What we don't want to get bogged down into really is seeing football from this westernised point of view that the only elite competitions can be in Europe. Um, the Asian Champions League that they compete in is obviously a huge tournament in Asia and um, the Saudi teams have got a, quite a strong history in it. Um, I think, the I don't know the exact numbers, but um, I think Saudi Arabia are one of the most dominant countries in terms of winners of the, of the Champions League, the Asian Champions League. So from our point of view, it's, it's slightly different because of the, the, the geography of it. We are not used to seeing Saudi teams at the top level in terms of what we see on our television screens, on our social media every week. But I still think there is, um, you know, there's the need over there to push football to, to become um, the number one sport um, and to try and attract the best talent. The differences I think between the Serie A and the um, Serie A and the Premier League dominance is that when players were signed for these top leagues and top teams in Europe. It was done purely as a sporting enterprise to try and win the, tr the trophies, to try and win the leagues, to try and win the Champions League. Whereas I think with this current Saudi rebuild that's going on now, there is more to it than just a sporting aspiration. You know, we can talk about sports washing, you know, all day long, but the element of it is always going to be there. It's making the regime seem better and trying to win over opinion based on great sporting accolades. The, the success on the pitch probably comes second to the achievements of, you know, making, making their regime look to be fantastic. Yeah, it's more of a marketing ploy than anything else. And we think they, the minute they got Ronaldo in the bag was a massive turning point for them because he's the most marketable footballer there's ever been. Um, so that was just fantastic for them. And they, they could then attract other players. But I think the difference between those, the overspending of, say, Syria or the Premier League or, say, PSG when they bought um, Mbappe and Neymar and stuff, like, they're probably closer to it because it was such a huge jump in money that they're offering. It's not just a, oh, yeah, we'll offer you, like... 5 million more than what you'd earn in Europe. We're going to offer you 100 million more than what you'd earn in Europe. So I think people, you know, reading the newspaper at home, I don't know, I don't think many people read the newspaper anymore, but um, flicking through to it, seeing these stories, the, the aggravation is more about that other leagues can't compete with that money. So it doesn't seem like a fair fight in that regard. If that if the only thing that that player thinks about is money, then the other leagues can't compete. Yeah, and that's it. Like you say, it's the, the disparity between wages um, in Europe and um, in Saudi Arabia now is getting incredibly large. 
at the moment, while there's only a handful of elite players playing in the league, there's still a, um, a sporting and competitive pull in Europe for players to stay in Europe. But over time, the more high-level players move over to Saudi Arabia, you'll have the financial and the competitive pull. And that's yeah. going to be really, really, really hard for the European leagues to compete with. Yeah, I don't think they're anywhere near done at all. Um, I think this is really just a start. Because if, even if you think at some of the players that they, they've managed to bring in, um, they're not all world beaters, are they? They're the, they're the ground um, groundsmen for, for what is to come. I mean, you've got Caladu Kulabali. He's had a terrible season at Chelsea. And then he goes and makes literally millions in Saudi Arabia because or there might be a move from Chelsea. He could have gone to most clubs in Europe. Like, he's still a good defender. He's still got potential. He's still quite young. He still could have played European football, but he thought, I've had a bad season. Let me go make a quick 50, 100 mil. I can't remember what the contract is, but I know it's something insane. And maybe I'll come back in a couple of years' time when I'm like 27, because I think he's like 24 or something. Probably should have researched this. But it's like, it seems to be somewhat where, you know, these younger players are just like, well, that's a quick book. That we, Let's go let's go and do that. And they don't even have to be that good. Yeah, I think he could have had his case. He's a little bit older, isn't he? So I think it might be a case of him of it might be one of his last paychecks. But in that in that conversation of 50 or 100 million, it doesn't really matter. Once you're in that sort of money, it's, it's irrelevant to what it actually is. Yeah, honestly. Oh, can't believe I've, I've, I've missed Steam Tulabali's age. I thought he was quite young. Let's have a it's look. all right. Yeah, he is 32, isn't he? Wow. Right, there you go. In the comments, let me know how stupid I am. Um, uh, so moving on from if they're destroying football or not, which is still pretty much in the air, we don't really know yet, how far can their recruitment strategy actually go? In a short answer, as far as they want. Endless pot of money with endless talent around Europe that they could cherry pick from, with government own, owning four of the clubs, it can really go as far as they want to. And a lot of it depends really on how many players in the European leagues want to jump ship and play there. So it's a waiting game really still, uh, but I don't think there's really much of a ceiling in terms of how far it can go. Do you think in the future European clubs will bring in Saudi clauses into contracts saying that they will not accept offers from Saudi clubs if they come in for them? Football agents aren't daft, and especially the ones that look after some of the uh, elite players in Europe. Yeah. If a club tried to implement a clause of that nature into a contract, I think an agent would be all over that um, and probably try and do the opposite in a sense of try and extract every last penny from a Saudi, from a Saudi deal they possibly could. It'd be nice in theory, but I worry that agents would start getting their mucky fingers into it and stop that happening. Yeah, they're quite good at um, extracting money from people that actually do the work for them, aren't they? Very much so. So I I just feel like there comes a point where you get these these players where that money isn't enough for them. That money isn't what they're they're looking for. Like at the end of the day, any Premier League footballer is is good for, for good for a tenner, aren't they? Not the red line, are they? Yeah. So. I just have a feeling like, yeah, we see players as greedy, overpaid and all that. Personally, I don't think they're overpaid. Well, I think my, maybe some of the Saudi lot are overpaid. But, like, I feel like some players would just say no. They'd want to be at home. They'd want to be with their families. There's things that's more important to them than, say, making a ton of money when they already make a lot. Now, that is, they already do make moves for money, of course. They already fly across Europe. So so maybe that kind of, kind of waters down that argument. But I just feel like they'll get to a point where they've found all the players that will play in Saudi Arabia. And then that's, that's their league. That's it done. 
I agree. I agree. I think there always will be players that um, play the game more than just for money. Um, there'll be family ties to countries. There'll be sentimental. You'd hope there might still be some sentimental club ties to certain clubs and they don't want to leave. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a competitive edge to it as well. Um, if the league isn't competitive enough and they're not playing in the, in the UEFA Champions League and the Asian Champions League isn't strong enough yet, they might still want to push themselves and play in the strongest competitions in the world. And again, it comes back to how high to see it. If a lot of players do move over there, you know, it's kind of, you open open the gate and the, the floodgates will open, but it just takes a few to cross that cross that line first um, for the floodgates to open. Yeah. Like you said, there will be a few that, want, that would like to stay, um, but money is more of a pull than I think we realise, unfortunately. Yeah, I think the thing I'm looking at is the biggest reference point for this um, massive round spell in the Saudi Pro League is Live Golf. You know, the the golf competition that was um, created by Saudi to basically try and attract the top golfers in the world away from the uh, PJ Tour. And they did that first by going after the older guys the guys that were kind of on their way out and giving them millions to, to go and play because on the golf tour, if you're not playing well, you don't get paid. If you don't make the first 64 cut in the first two days of a tournament, you get nothing, even, even if you've had to pay money to be there. So they went for those older guys that were kind of dropping off a bit, paying them a steady wage of millions and millions to get them to play in that competition. Then they went after one or two big fish and they got them. They managed to get them into that, um, uh, into that fold and away from the PGA Tour because the ruling was if they were playing in live golf, you couldn't play on the PGA. But then I think there were players that stayed massively loyal to the PGA. You had Tiger Woods was offered an $800 million pound well dollar a year contract to play on live tour and he stayed in the P pga he's doing nothing on the pga tour now he's a broken man quite literally that that car crash destroyed him he can't play a full 18 without being severely hurt anymore he could have made an 800 million for just turning up and playing but he refused to he wanted to play on the pga rory mcelroy one of the brightest stars in the world refused millions and millions to play on the PGA. There was still a massive group of uh, players that just stayed loyal to the PGA Tour despite being offered millions of pounds to play on the PGA and it was uh, to play on live. And it was because of the history that the PGA Tour holds. It was because of that tradition that that's what they've grown up with. So that's their dream to play in. That's what they want to do. And I feel like that sh would be um, uh, emulated to the same in football. There are players that have grown up dreaming of winning the Premier League, dreaming of winning the FA Cup, and especially dreaming of winning the Champions League because they've seen so many players do it before. And I see those similarities and I just feel like that has to be the case because... Um, because those traditions and those historic elements are the same in golf as in football. Well said. Yeah, I definitely agree with regards to the uh, the live golf thing. And what we're seeing really is kind of a copy and paste effect of, you know, it, it worked for them initially to to attract the, the older stars. Then once the competition's in place and there's a bit of hype around it, then to try and bring the younger ones in. And obviously that whole live story has, has ended with the PGA essentially just caving in and accepting their fate um, as being the world's second most competitive golf tour. So, and that's only taken just over about a year, I think, since live yeah, um, I think was formed. The, so. the PGA was um, more in the case of we can't have those players playing in four of our um so the way it works was that you've got your pga tour and then you've got your four kind of it, almost like tennis like grand slams like i'm going to yeah. to, 
to be not that much of a golf fan, but I do like it. Um, uh, but so the the live golf players could play in those four majors, but they couldn't play on the, the PGA tour. And I think the PGA were a little bit like we can't really have them winning the the four majors and then you know pissing but off. Yeah. yeah and like going and earning their millions because it dilutes what we have so I think they just came to an agreement to I don't think it was more of a settlement to say right we're the second biggest I think it was more of a we're gonna come together again we're gonna like join up we're not gonna fight each other anymore um uh, which I don't know Still, I kind of, I thought the actual um, drama was quite good for golf. You know, these, these two, like, warring, because, um, you know, people think golf's boring. And I think the idea of, like, two warring sections of, of the golf society would be, it was a really good thing for golf. And they made good documentaries. But, you know, they've they've decided to settle and, and that's good for them. But I just, I do see those similarities between... Yeah, football and and the the golf golf section, and I think you will get those stalwart uh, defenders of footballing tradition, um, uh, but maybe they they aren't the best players in the world. Who knows? But um, it's definitely going to be an interesting couple of years to see how far the Saudis can actually take it. Can they recruit a well, Kevin De Bruyne probably because he's getting old can they recruit an Erling Haaland can they recruit a Kylian Mbappe is it possible for them to do that or do those players want to achieve all they can achieve in Europe first which Haaland already has done and or do they just want the quick 200 mil and then maybe come back to Europe later in their career it is going to be an, an interesting watch um, quite depressing for some of us who just are European football purists um uh, but also probably a little bit ignorant from our standpoint too yeah de- definitely Luke it's um it will be interesting it will be very interesting because we don't know until one of these big names goes over there just how competitive the league can be as well yeah. um and I think that's, like I say, going to be one of the the, the next biggest uh, draw drawing factor to that league. Other than just money, it will be the competitiveness of the league as well. So our final question: What does the Saudi league mean for all other leagues in world football? I think to take the league in isolation will be quite naive. I think you've got to think about it as a global footballing picture. Um, and I think of it with the new Club World Cup format in mind. There's a reason why the government or well, the PIF have uh, purchased the four bigger clubs in Saudi Arabia uh, at this specific moment in time. It's a, it's a plan um, with this Club World Cup in mind that starts um, in two years time. 32 teams in it. Um, from what I've researched and looked at, I think Asia will get four teams in it or could be more than four teams. Um, and I think what the plan is, is potentially recruit well enough to get some of their teams on the global stage competing against other teams in Europe um, and the rest of the world, you know, competing in essentially what will be a World Super League, well, a World Super Cup. Um, and who knows how the success or failure probably success of that tournament will impact on world football as a whole. So I think just to look at the Saudi development of, of football and see it as a one country trying to build their league will be quite short-sighted. I think they, they have got plans um, for world football that the rest of us aren't quite caught up with yet. Yeah. And I think, um, uh, I think it might be, quite strange to think of a world world club football cup wow that's a mouthful anyway because like that is any bigger than than what we've already known because personally I, i've never watched a um a club football world cup ever but they have been around you know they've been around yeah. since, like donkey's years but i've never been bothered even when my own team manchester united were winning them never never bothered to watch 
because it just, I, just didn't seem like relevant. It just didn't seem. It felt more like a preseason uh, tournament, if I'm honest. Like apart from United, United, when United dropped out of the FA Cup to take part in it. Yeah, I do, I just like it. Just feels like a FA Cup, um, not an FA Cup, a preseason uh, tournament. I just don't. It doesn't seem that important. Like it's great to look on a TV. Wow, football club uh, World Cup. Wow. But I don't see it as that popular. I'm, I'm unsure of um, any other football fans that are like, oh, did you watch watch that game last night? Like, I've never really had those conversations with people. There's a, I think it's difficult because there is so much football on, on TV. It, it can be hard to motivate yourself to watch um, the European champions taking on the Asian champions or whoever in, in a game that, especially I think in, in Europe, it's seen more as like a... I don't know, a, a European Super Cup 2.0 or a Community Shield 2.0 um, on maybe a much a bit, bit of bigger stage. And I think FIFA have recognised that as well. And I think that's why they've introduced this. Um, and I think that's why uh, the Saudi League is so interested in it, because there is there's genuinely obviously a great, great marketing potential with, a you know, to say you're the best club in the world is um, is massive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at the moment, the current format doesn't really tell tell you enough um, about the teams, the other teams in the world, to actually safely say that the winning team of that club World Cup is the best club in the world. You know, as we know from the Champions League expansions and the World Cup expansions, more games equals more money. Um, the better teams playing in more games equals even more money. Um, and as you talked about right at the start, this the sort of spread of talent around the world. If every single game has got a superstar in it, then more people are going to be inclined to want to watch those games. So I think the future of football is um, very much dependent on the success of this new Club World Cup. And it might seem a bit of a stretch at this point in time to put so much um, of football's destiny in the hands of this tournament that hasn't even started yet. But a hill that I will die on is this Club World Cup will be a defining factor in the way that football moves forward uh, in the future. Yeah. So I think in terms of what you were saying about the um, spread of talent across the world, it's a really tough thing to think about because beforehand, all the superstars, and there are finite superstars in football, would come to Europe to kind of show off their talents. And you had the five biggest leagues in Europe that were the top leagues that you could watch for competitive football. Now those superstars are spreading out across the world, which, you know, sounds great, you know, more like <laughs> in cultured, like more, <laughs> we get to see more football around the world. It's brilliant. But actually what it does is water down the football in product. It um, makes each league slightly less competitive. It makes the leagues that they've gone to a bit more competitive, but it's into much more of a level playing field, which, again, sounds nice. But when you think about it, that just means that when you're watching the Premier League, which was the most competitive league in the world for many years, some argue that it still is. I'm not entirely sure. It's it's English bias and all that. But you're probably more likely to watch, uh, be watching the level of a lower league in England because the superstars may have left. And though it just doesn't provide the footballing product that we're used to. So my example always is the NBA. You've got the 450 best players in the world playing the NBA and all of the basketball leagues want to get to the NBA. They, they want to, their players, they want to go to the NBA. They don't want to stay in their league forever. If they have a chance to go to the NBA, they're going to the NBA because it's, it proves you to be the best. Whereas if we continue this spread of talent in football, those leagues are going to get weaker and weaker and we won't have a league like that that is the best players play there or five leagues like that saying the best players play there. So it would be... You know, it sounds really nice that all the talent in football is spreading around the world. But what it actually means is probably worse and worse football games with one or two superstars playing in the game rather than four or five 
which makes it so much better. Yeah, and I feel like I'm going to be um, I'm beating the beating the drum of the club world, anti new club World Cup format again. If we are watching Champions League football, Europe, UEFA Champions League football, um, and the quality is diluted because a lot of the superstars are now elsewhere. Where are we going to go to watch these superstars play against each other every single game? The new Club World Cup. Yeah. The talent spread that could be caused by this will only benefit these new, well, these new um, revised competitions. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it's, just, it's all in cycles because there would have been in the last five, ten years, um, fans of um, Italian football, Spanish football, German football, where their top talent, maybe not Germany, because it all goes to one club in that country, yeah. but their top talent is coming to England. Um, you know, as, as we see the likes of West Ham, who were spent most of the last season in a relegation fight, winning the European trophy. Yeah. Um, the Premier League currently has most of the world's top talent. A lot of people in Spain, Italy, France, might, will be disappointed at that and, and will be looking forward to seeing a lot of players leave the Premier League and try the luck elsewhere. Whereas we're get, we're sort of getting used in this country, getting used to having the best talent and being able to attract the best talent. Um, that it's a massive shock to us. Um, obviously, we've got Newcastle um, in the Premier League, who could be a different conversation altogether um, in terms of what their aspirations are and how that how their aspirations link in um, to the Saudi plans, but. If we do see talent leave the Premier League, it's nothing that we haven't done ourselves to other countries. Yes. Who do you think is a bigger priority for the Saudi government? Newcastle United or the Saudi Pro League? It's a coin toss. I really do. I think for the time being, Newcastle United. Because okay. Europe is still where the top most of the top players are playing and where the most important and prestigious prizes are in terms of Premier League, Champions League. If Newcastle can be successful um, in terms of winning a Premier League title or winning a Champions League or even going out in the group stage and winning the Europa League, if they can win something impressive next season, that's going to be going to be a much bigger marker for the uh, the public investment fund um, yeah. than... Um, signing another couple of superstars for Al Hilal or whoever. Yeah. The time being, I'll say Newcastle. In the next three to five years, I could see that club being slightly neglected um in favour of supporting the league. And it might make one or two of their fans look silly when Bruno Gimaraish is shipped to Al Etihad on loan or whatever. Yeah. But you I know. think um, I've heard stories about the um, idea of Ruben Neves being loaned back to Newcastle United after signing that ridiculous um, contract in Saudi. Um, I think that might be a might be a way they do it is start signing these superstars and for the first like maybe two seasons decide oh yeah Newcastle do you want do you want this player do you want Benzema Newcastle. <laughs> like, um, I think that that definitely might be a thing, but I also think that it's. It's a sad state of affairs, but I think only really other state-owned clubs are actually going to compete with Newcastle, which means that the Premier League or European football is just going to be like a spitting contest between the shakes of the Middle East. Like you've you've got you know City owned by Sheikh Mansour, you've got the possibility of Manchester United owned by Sheikh Jassim. It like it will become a this like chess match between like these extremely rich states buying clubs in Europe and basically kind of shitting on each other through football. Um, uh, I think that's probably what we've got in store. It's a scary prospect because you're going to end up with um, Premier League games basically being an ego competition between Middle Eastern states. Um, and call me old fashioned, but that's not really what football is all about. Um, really? Even if, even if they were owned, if owned by, let's let's forget about human rights records for one minute. Even if they were owned by a beautiful, lo loving country, I don't know. Don't think there are any. Yeah, no, I don't think there are. 
let's say uh, they were bought by you know, the most beautiful, loving country in the world. Being a, a football club being owned by a nation state, full stop, is a concern because, you know, especially if they've got a complete, you know, infinite wealth they can spend, it stops being about the football and it starts being about, like you say, the egos and the spitting contest between um, the these states that are, you know, geographical rivals as well. Yeah. It just doesn't bode well for the future of football. Yeah, there's definitely elements as well of that split between fans and the club now is that, of course, football clubs have been owned by people for a very long time now. But originally it was, there were fan clubs, they were built by fans. And we still very much say, like, um, I'll say Manchester United is my club. It's not, like, grammatically, it's not my club. I don't own any part of it. And I think we're starting to see more and more clubs have that separation between the fans really have nothing to do with the football club other than paying the tickets to go and watch them. Um, And I do kind of see a really, you know, daunting future that that might be more of the case. Yeah, and I really don't see how it ends now. I think um, the horse has bolted massively. And I think it bolted with City, to be honest. But I think a lot of people were too busy asleep to notice it really happening. Um, especially as they'd just come they from the, uh, the, the ownership of um, Sino Archer as well. And it was kind of a deal uh, brought through with Sheikh Mansour and uh, Abu Dhabi. That was the, I think that was the moment where it, it turned. But I think none of us really realised yeah. Um, I mean, I didn't. I was probably about eleven years old. But uh, <laughs> I just think, I remember thinking, oh, Rabinho is a good player. Um, mm. And that's, but that is that is it. I'm not a City fan, but then signing Rabinho was I sort of sports washed? But you know, because yeah. I was young and you know impressionable, that was I just saw a good player playing for a team that's not really had good players before. It was yeah. a surprise. It was a novelty. Um, and I think that's that's the worry that now the horse has bolted. Nothing was done to stop Saudi and Newcastle. So nothing can really be done to stop Sheikh Jassim and Manchester United. Where does it end? It yeah. doesn't. All right. I think that is a very good place to stop. So please like this video. Make sure you comment to tell us probably how wrong I am. And subscribe to help us reach a thousand. We want to build a community of sports lovers here and hopefully a community of very well-behaved people, so don't say anything nasty, please. Thank you very much, and see you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.